trying to kind of focus in on some key concepts instead of covering everything in the textbook in the last two chapters. So for chapter six, we're going to be looking at the first part of chapter six, a little bit of the deuterium exchange, and then the, uh, let's see, the chiral uh, derivatives and NOE. And then for chapter 10, which is our 2D, we're going to be doing, uh, we can look over, I do recommend you look over the first part of chapter 10. It talks a little bit about the whole sequences, which we talked about when we were talking about the decoupled carbon. So we already kind of covered that, but I don't want to get into a lot of the detail behind the experiments because I want to actually do a little bit more interpreting. So we're going to focus on the interpreting of the spectra rather than how they're gained because the pulse sequences get pretty complicated for the 2D. So that is chapter 10.7 through 10.10 for the more of the in-depth focus. Your homework is going to be posted tonight. It's going to be one massive NMR problem. So it's going to be one sample. It's going to have a proton, carbon, depth, cozy, HMQC. You're going to get to do labeling all the correlations in the 2D as well as drawing out splitting patterns from the sample. So it's all just going to be the one. And I'm actually running the samples myself, and so you'll get to work them up on Delta, so you can actually zoom in on things and look at them. But each and every one of you needs to do the work up on Delta on your own. Don't have one person do it and save it, and then everybody looks at the same one. So I want you to have the experience with that as well. So everybody turn in their own work up. Do we have to do data coupling? Yes. I'm supposed to not want to speak talking about it. That's why we practice it. Um, no, we were moving on from that. Unless you guys wanted to. Yes. Um, so I understand finding between the peaks what they are and then, um, and then making the little tree diagram. I'm not certain, I guess, for instance, like on the lab, on the post up that I was doing, it was like, split this one once at this number and split this one three times at this number. How do you have to split three times at the same number versus one time? Well, that would mostly be dependent on the structure that you're looking at. And the examples I did in class, all of our hydrogens were different, so they all had different coupling constants because they were either diastereotopic or on the alkene, so they weren't the same. But if we were looking at something
No, but it's a structure. Mm -hmm. I guess I had a label bar. I had two of them I was running. And neither of them is here now because I was running for So actually, we were looking at this hydrogen, but same story. It has the two hydrogens that are equivalent here. We also have two different hydrogens, so in this case, it's going to split it again at a different value. And I'm just making up values here. We'd have to analyze it to see what it is. Um, but you're going to end up with some random splitting there. But the key here is that the first two hydrogens, the these two hydrogens split it the same amount. And you'll measure all those values from the NMR. Okay? We'll do some more practice of these. We're going to do a few examples over this week. So we'll do some more practice of the splitting and the reading of the 2D and things like that. So is that splitting counting just for the hydrogen that we were talking about? Just this, this one. The whole honeycomb? <laughs> yeah, that would be the one at about 5.8 here. Um, which doesn't quite line up because it has different Jake values than I'm actually drawing up here. Oh, so that's just, oh. It's, this is the number of splitting mm -hmm. tiers you'd have to do on a tree diagram, mm -hmm. but it's not the exact representation because my tree values aren't measured. I just was pretending. Okay. A couple things before we come to this 2D, though, I want to talk about the exchange of protons, archival resolving agents, and the NOE different spectra. We've already talked about the deuterium exchange of alcohols and amides and things like that, but the chapter six is goes into more detail about the different functional groups and how they interact with deuterium. And this is kind of a summary table I made up. So our alcohols, our phenols, and our carboxyl acids all have an OH group. Their chemical shift depends on the type of functional group. So an alcohol is going to be a little bit lower chemical shift than the phenols, and then the carboxyl acids tend to be very uh, high. The other thing with these D2O, or sorry, the OH and the NH peaks is they tend to be fairly broad. And especially in the carboxyl acids, those are going to be exceedingly broad to the point where you might not actually see the peak, because it's going to be really broad, and if all the other peaks are really tall, it's going to kind of be dwarfed and look like baseline, so you got to kind of zoom in there to see that it's actually there. Uh, clues towards the fact that you have a carboxylic acid may not come from the proton NMR. Where could we get clues from that? IR might be a good place. Uh, carbon-13. NMR. If you have a carbonyl peak, you can start thinking about what type of carbonyl you have, and so you want to use all the different pieces to put together. Neighbor splitting. Alcohols sometimes split the CH2 group that's next to them, but not always. And 
It depends on the concentration usually and how dry your sample is. And there is a, uh, I have an example where we actually will see the splitting between the OH and the neighbor. Usually you need a really dry sample though, and so they can be in more complex systems. But if you have just like methanol or ethanol, you're not gonna see that splitting. Don't rely on it to be there, but also don't count it out if you see splitting. It's not necessarily, oh, I don't have an alcohol all of a sudden. It can be an alcohol. The best test for whether it's gonna be an alcohol or not in proton NMR is to do the deuterium exchange and see if it swaps out. So an alcohol or a phenol, you add and drop a D2O, it's gonna be a very rapid exchange between the deuterium and the hydrogen on the alcohol, which we've already talked about, and you end up getting rid of the alcohol signal. The carboxylic acids, uh, they mentioned they're often run in D2O with a little bit of base to help make it more soluble in the water solvent, and so that's just a common thing they do. And in the phenols and carboxylic acids, you're probably not going to see splitting even if they're really dry because they typically don't have a CH2 or something next to them to split, right? Phenols are off the benzene ring, carboxylic acids have a carbonyl right next to them, so they don't have carbons with hydrogens <coughs> next to them, typically. Your amines and amines are a little bit different. Again, we have the amines at a lower chemical shift and the amines higher. The amines are typically don't show coupling, but they can show coupling with their neighbors. Uh, we may see a broad peak or you may see splitting again, depending on how dry your sample is. In the amines, you actually typically do see coupling between the peaks. And in this case, we're probably looking at the nitrogen coupling to an alkyl chain that's attached to it so that you have a CH2 group like this, and that could show coupling between this hydrogen and these two hydrogens. And actually very likely might show that coupling. The amines are a little bit slower to exchange their protons than the alcohol. So if you add a drop of D2O, they may exchange, but maybe at a slower rate. So if you took your NMR right away, it may not, the signal may not completely disappear. If you waited a little longer, it probably would. If you add a little bit of DCL, which would be the deut deuterated equivalent of HCL, so we're adding a strong acid, it's going to protonate the amine, and then the exchange of the hydrogens becomes very rapid. And so that's the way to deuterate the amine or the amine. CHs, the only CHs we're going to see exchange are possibly ones next to a carbonyl. So we're talking about the alpha CH here, and the carbon next to the carbonyl. In a standard CH where it's just uh, one carbonyl, it can form this enol, enol structure being here, but this is actually pretty rare when we talked about this in uh, organic chemistry, it's usually about 99 to 1 in the equilibrium ratio of the enol to the, or the keto form to the enol form. And you typically, I don't know why that says no. Those should say yes, if they have neighbors, they're gonna split if there's a hydrogen there. You would see that. If you put deuterium in here very slowly, this would equilibrate and incorporate in the deuterium. If you added a little bit of strong base, if you added a methanol that's deuterated, you're going to exchange out those protons pretty rapidly. And that's actually how they make the deuterated acetone, is they'll take acetone and exchange it with the deuterium until it's completely deuterated on all of those hydrogens. The last category is the 1,3-dicarbonyl. In this one, you have two carbonyls that are one, two, three carbons away. 
And in this case, the hydrogens that are between them are very acidic, and so they're easy to remove. And actually, this one exists primarily in the enol form. A little bit of hydrogen bonding between those two. And so you will see the enol, and there's rapid equilibrium between the two. So when you put D2O in here, that CH2 group here is going to rapidly switch to... Oh, I now remember why I put that. So the deuterium there is going to equilibrate. I remember why I put the no for the neighbor splitting. If we're talking about the enol form here, well, we don't have direct neighbors, so you don't see the splitting. But if it's in the keto form, you do see the splitting. So enols, typically no splitting.
book talks about chemical shift resolving agents, the addition of the europium uh, structure to complex to your compound, and it will separate your NMR signal so you can tell the difference between them. That was a technique that was used a lot more when we had very low field NMR. Now that we have higher field NMR, our peaks are already separated out fairly well, and they're not used as often. The chiral resolving agents are used, and one of the main uses for this is if you were doing an organic synthesis and you were trying to make a stereocenter in the molecule, so let's say I was doing had this alcohol and I wanted to reduce it to the, or sorry, I started with ketone and I wanted to reduce it to the alcohol, but I wanted it in antio-rich. So I want to have only one stereoisomer. You need a way to determine how much of that one stereoisomer you actually got in the end of the reaction. And so let's say we use some type of ligand that could reduce this in an antioselective fashion. And we'll just make this boring. Maybe we have two ligands on there. Those are chiral ligands that are going to add to one face of the ketone more than the other. Now we get this mixture out in the end, but if we take an NMR of this sample, we're not going to see the difference between the two enantiomers because the two enantiomers are going to show up as the same signal. You're going to see the diastereotopic protons here, but this enantiomer and this enantiomer, the RNS enantiomer, show up with the same signals because both of them have a hydrogen that's next to the OH and one that's away. And so you actually can't tell the difference between the two enantiomers in NMR. However, if we were to add something that would cause these to form diastereomers, now we would be able to tell them apart in the NMR, and you would be able to maybe measure your ratios of the two peaks, and then you'd know how good your reaction methodology was. And so the two methods that are commonly used the first one is an ionic one, and the second one is a covalent one. Since my method, or my alcohol here that I made, is more useful for the covalent one, we'll start with that one. Both of these, the general idea is to take a chiromolecule and get it to form some type of bond with the mixture of enantiomers that you have so that you can tell them apart. We're either going to form an ionic bond or a covalent bond. So the covalent bond is going to take that alcohol. I'll try and draw it the same way I had up there. So now we have this alcohol of some unknown E. which is the enantiomeric excess, if you remember from organic, or not. <laughs> and you would take that alcohol and treat it with a, what we call a Mosher ester, which has a CH3 group here, OCH3, and a phenyl group here. And so we have a compound that has a stereocenter. This one we get in antiopier. And typically you would buy this. I was looking up the structure on Sigma Aldrich and I noticed the price for 100 milligrams. It's $86.70 for 100 milligrams. So not a cheap way to go. Uh, but you don't need a lot. You're just using maybe 10 milligrams because you just need enough for an NMR sample. Those two uh, react together to form an ester bond. And you're going to have an ester with the carbonyl off of the 
this oxygen and stereo centers all stay the same. But remember, my original sample is not 100% DE, so it's going to have a little bit of the other enantiomer in it, the unknown amount. And that's going to form another ester. These are now diastereomeric salts, yes. So they are diastereomers. And again, you can tell the difference between them by NMR. something. 
Has to be. Yeah, I mean, they're all easy, just to work things that you wish Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is a really weird, funky coupling. Trans is the same side, right? Trans is the opposite. Trans is the opposite, it's like a line. Trans is different, yeah. So, so that'd be, so F would be higher? No, F would have a bigger coupling constant. So F would be higher? I think it's really more like right there is where we're splitting, so I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. If, it's, if one has just a really huge J coupling and the other one's split, I don't know. I think, yeah, there's four peaks and two of them go to each one. system and so 
One of them is going to be E and one of them is F. Which one, if we divided them right there, one that's more downfield, is that going to be E or F? Why? Transcoupling is going to give us a bigger number, so that will be more likely to be F. assign those a little bit better, but I just want to talk about the NOE before we go on to that. So we'll come back to this. I needed my molecule to talk about NOE.
the methyl group is showing up, which doesn't have any coupling to it, but when you build the molecule, you can see that this methyl group can kind of rotate and come close to it in space. And so that's a through space interaction. It can help you assign which hydrogen is which in the proton spectrum. So I now know that this proton is the one that's interacting with this methoxy group because this hydrogen doesn't ever get close enough to interact with it. They also irradiated the other J, I think, Down here, when they irradiated this J, that methyl methoxy group doesn't show up at all. But the I group does show up. So now they're looking at this J, and the I hydrogen shows up, and a little bit of some other stuff. But your significant peak is your I to J. Irradiating. I here in the second one down, you see a strong signal for this J, but this J is relatively weak. If you were to integrate those, you would see that the interaction between this peak and I is a lot less than the interaction between this peak and I. And if you look at the structure here, the I is down here. A through space interaction with this hydrogen is pretty weak because they're pointing in opposite directions whereas this one is relatively strong because they're uh, close to each other in more of an axial equatorial interaction. So this is different than your spin-spin coupling because we did talk about cyclohexanes having different axial and equatorial couplings. And actually your axial-axial interaction is going to be your strongest interaction there and your axial equatorial um, would be a little bit weaker. But the NOE compares them through space the other interesting one, I believe this is the irradiation of the methoxy group, and you don't see a significant impact of that one with any of the other hydrogens there. So the irradiation of that methyl methoxy doesn't significantly impact it, but it's a rather noisy spectrum, as you see, and so there may be a little bit of this peak that might show up, but it looks like it's kind of getting bombarded by whatever irradiation. So you have to be careful with this technique because you're, you're irradiating something that's really close together, like these two peaks, sometimes they don't show up very well. The NOE difference is just a good way to show confirmations of molecules or confirming how close together things are in space, especially when you have bicyclic things or things that are forming rings that might fold together and put two peaks too close together that normally wouldn't. It's a good thing to uh, be aware of and a good technique to look at. Any questions about that? Victoria? Um, I don't get it at all. I, I'm confused on if we're only uh, irradiating one proton. Mm -hmm. Like on NOE1, we're irradiating J, right? Right. And that's why I got sucked underneath. Right. So what we do is we irradiate J and then we, uh, J is going to interact with things around it. So we give it a little time to interact with the things around it, and then we collect the spectrum. It's going to transfer some of that energy we gave it to the protons that are close to it in space. So like C and I? Yes. So when it transfers that energy to the ones that are next to it, is that result in a shift or just an increase in intensity? Or well, so it's going to transfer that energy through that hydrogen getting excited, excited into the excited state. It doesn't change the chemical shift, but it's going to change the population. Then when we monitor it, we're going to watch that relax back down, and that's where we see the FID, the free induction decay. So we're actually seeing you let them get a little bit excited by irradiating the one and then seeing what else it excites in the molecule, and then we take that, uh, then we monitor what else is excited based on that one that we excited. So the point of the NOE that's better than just doing the regular is to see what protons are being affected by other protons? It's to see how close they are in space. Remember, this is the through space interaction. So it's not, we can get coupling constants to see how they're connected in a molecule, but we may not know 
one thing they may not have known is how this was bonded together. So maybe instead of having this methyl group, methoxy group up here, maybe it was a different conformation around the ring. We wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference between if I switch these two groups, right? Because coupling constants aren't going to change significantly from that. But the interaction between this methyl group and the other things in the molecule does tell us the conformation around those two um, bonds. So if the signal's strong, then that means it's closer to space. Yes. Really? Can you say what the negative means again? The negative is just the peak that we are radiating. So we're getting, we're giving uh, the radio frequency at exactly that radio frequency. And so they're uh, very excited. And then we're just looking at the little effects of the other ones. So in so NLE1, we're seeing IJ, uh, it looks like a bit of H. Right? A little bit of H, yes. Why is C showing up, or is that P not? In NOE1, we're looking at this head, this green one right here. Yeah. So that's the one that, if we were to draw it in, would be on a wedge on this J. That one is interacting through space. That's why I needed the model, so you could see that those can actually, through space, have an interaction. It also can have an interaction with this H group here. That's H. And then a slight interaction with this one. But Then when you irradiate uh, the other J, you get a different interaction for space. So a little bit with H. Not much, though. Actually very little with H. Don't see much. But we do see a strong I. You don't see the methoxy group, so we can tell which side the methoxy group is on. Do that. So it's good for telling us how close in space things are probably going to want that when you're looking at the conductivity of your unknown that you're doing on your problem set. So I'm trying to run an NOE. These are actually, the 2D ones take a long time. I don't know what parameter to change to make it shorter, but uh, yeah. Other questions on that? Okay. Let's do a brief introduction to 2D NMR. And then we'll come back and go over more of it on Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Your chemistry called jobs are available. So if you're interested in being a TA or a tutor or a lab, solution prep person, any of those, you do your sign up for those jobs because we like having you around. Seniors get to graduate and find real jobs. <laughs> Don't remind them. <laughs> I can be all of the TAs. <laughs> okay, so we are going to talk about 2D and Mark. There's a lot of complex stuff that goes on behind the scenes of 2D NMR, but we're kind of going to just skip over it and talk about how to do it. My brief definition of what 2D NMR is, we excite one nucleus and look at the effect at another nucleus. general because it could be a proton-proton correlation, proton-carbon, or if you get into more esoteric things, proton-nitrogen, and things like that. Uh, in general, you're going to have your normal pulse, and then there's going to be some time delay. We're going to call that time T1. We're going to call that the evolution. <coughs> Then there's going to be a second pulse. And 
And then we're going to do our detection. First pulse is going to excite the one nucleus, then we're going to have some time uh, delay in between that and a second pulse, which is going to excite them in a different manner, and then we have the detection. The way this is 2D, we have our first, our normal time domain spectrum, right? We convert the FID into a time domain spectrum. So that would be our 1D NMR. The 2D NMR takes a bunch of these, but they vary time 1. So T1 is varied in uh, the 2D NMR. You take a series of these with different T1 times, and then you get a second time domain. So now we have two axes, one here and one here. That's about as far into the details I want to go on that. Um, I know that there is some um, crazy uh, the vector model, and it does explain it pretty well, but it's rather confusing, and I felt like that was going to take too much time to try and explain it. I do want to do a brief introduction because we have two minutes left. Be one of those teachers. <laughs> Don't be one of those teachers. Mondays are just not good days <laughs> <laughs> Kind of. 
domains, and it's just scanning the whole thing that you tell it to scan. So if you were to change the parameters, somehow that would and it'd be way too complicated. <laughs> you keep your spectrum width the same way, the whole time it'll be a lot easier. So this is not based on the GA values, right? Or the yeah, the GA values, because like, how does it know not to put a, um, a spec on like the last yeah. in other places where they cross over? Right, so we'll go into the interpretation of this, but it's only going to show up uh, a peak where the two protons are coupling each other. And so we'll do the whole analysis of this on Wednesday.